Um, so my name is Steve Small and thank you all for coming on this evening's uh, webinar. Um, you're obviously all passionate about spine care and I hope that this evening you're going to see some insights to a, um, a development in spine care which has been building over the years. Um, just to sort of introduce myself, um, for those of you that um, don't know me, I know some of you do, um, but um, yeah, my name is Steve Swan. I look after the IDD therapy um, spinal decompression providers in the UK and in certain countries in Europe and the Middle East. Um, I've been working in this mid-ground of spine care for about 10 years now, just over 10 years. It seems like yesterday um, until I look in the mirror and remind myself I don't look quite the same as I did uh, back in the day. And, um, and I was in a previous life working predominantly in large corporations and working mainly in Africa. Um, I've been to um, 34 countries in Africa. And on one of these trips, I got a phone call from somebody I know who was at a, who was working in America at a factory in Florida where this new category of um, spinal decompression was emerging. It sounded very interesting because in the context there was a category of patient who was not responding to manual therapy and exercise and this new treatment was um, sort of um, expanding rapidly. So I got on a plane and I went to a clinic in Egypt of all places where a Canadian neurosurgeon um, who um, of Egyptian descent um, had migrated and he had two spinal decompression um, machines. So I hot footed over to Cairo where I, um, I, I met the team there and they were working from six in the morning till 11 at night. They were super passionate and, and I found them uh, talking to patients, uh, really engaged with this treatment. So like a madman, I decided it was a little bit like one of these moments where you might have the Beatles walk into your um, you know, recording studios where if I don't do this, I may regret this for the rest of my life. And I was very excited by it. So I started, uh, started down this path and here we are now, uh, ten, over 10 years later, with a network of clinics providing treatments and some really exciting things for patients with unresolved disc problems um, and, and sciatica. So on the call tonight, I expect we have some osteopaths, physiotherapists, chiropractors, a range of practitioners, and, and I hope that you're going to see some interesting things. I'm going to now share my screen because I'm going to basically run off a presentation. I'll try not to kill you by PowerPoint. Um, if you've got your cocoa, herbal tea or something stronger, then keep that at, um, you know, keep that to hand. Um, and I will share my screen now. Hopefully you can see that. Um, and hopefully you can see, um, hopefully you can see me. Uh, can you see me? Charles, yeah. can you see me? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to be looking at this, this question of how to treat an unresolved uh, herniated disc and sciatica. And what I want to um, sort of, in order to understand how we can do that, it's important to look back at some previous treatments um, and, how, um, and how they evolved, how they came, how they went, so that, and, and also the objectives of manual therapy so that we can consider how we might get better results. So over the next sort of 40 minutes, um, then I will be looking at um, this question of traction, traditional mechanical traction and decompressing targeted spinal segments. That's the big um, theme, I suppose, of today. And the combination of that treatment with manual therapy and exercise. I'll be sharing with you some things about indications and contraindications. I'm not presenting to you a cure all miracle elixir for back pain much as I would like. Um, but from that, we'll also to look at considerations around conservative spine care, where we are post pandemic and, and what we're looking at going forwards. I hope that is OK with you all. OK, so are you ready? Um, some of you may have seen this. So the first inversion table, um, Mr. Hippocrates. Um, so if, if all we needed was a ladder and a bit of rope, we, would all, we wouldn't need any of you guys and we'd be able to um, treat, uh, treat our patients. Um, 
the appeal of this kind of treatment came, I guess, because when we first became uh, upright, um, this notion of if compression and immobility lead to decompression, um, uh, sorry, uh, can cause de um, uh, pressure, degeneration, weakness and stiffness, then by doing the opposite, decompressing, we might um, address that uh, mobility, um, help restore function and improve uh, sorry, reduce pain. Some of you may be familiar with some of these earlier um, traction or typical traction machines that were found in physiotherapy clinics, not so not used so much within uh, osteopathy or uh, or chiropractic. Um, but um, these, uh, these these typical traction machines were used widely, but then they kind of went out of vogue. We had the um, cervical traction units, um, and I think that um, this sort of uh, unit hanging over a door you would not very appealing. And what I found interesting is that this, this old um, uh, sketch of the first lesson in osteopathy wasn't actually a sketch of uh, manual treatment, but was a sort of, um, uh, you know, a, a kind of non hands on uh, the treatment. So, so this question of traction has always had appeal. And you as manual therapists will use a variety of manual traction techniques in your treatments. And, and those will address 90% of the problems of uh, spinal uh, issues that come through your, um, your door. Here in the UK, uh, we have NICE recommendations and uh, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. Um, and tra this, this traction is not recommended, um, uh, do not use as a single modality. The Cochrane Review provides a, um, a kind of overview of all the available studies and shows that traction as a single modality is not effective. The interesting thing about the traction is that um, when looking at these reviews, Always in, in most practice, in, in most uh, professions, there's a, there's a always a question of you know an, uh, the available evidence and the scarcity of um, of good uh, evidence, uh, but also that 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 question of um, what what is the patient demographic and are they are we looking at um, specific groups of patients within that group rather than a group of patients as a whole. So in my experience, when I started, when I started with um, this, this treatment and I'd meet, meet practitioners and, and I'd meet people who had, um, so, so younger, younger um, physiotherapists, for example, are not taught um, mechanical traction with machines, um, but those who used to uh, use traction machines, what I've found, and uh, I've never found anyone who actually had a specific method, it would be a case of we would try a bit of traction and see what happened. And that uh, led to, um, you know, very inconsistent results. If somebody wasn't responding after two or three treatments, people would stop using it. So this led to a question of, okay, so as traction, as traction went out of vogue, um, this question of, well, what do we need to do differently? Because we've got this segment of the po patient population who is not, um, who's not kind of responding to treatment and clearly needs more. Um, and this is a device called a VAX-D, which was developed in the 1990s and created some interesting, um, uh, get this, an interesting study. And these were patients that you can see, and they were having a pre-surgery a, a, on, a, on a device that would distract the lumbar spine. You can see the patient lying prone, holding onto handles. And they recorded a reduction in intradiscal pressure, which is measured in millimeters of mercury from a positive pressure to a negative pressure. Now, this was deemed to be highly you know, significant, highly interesting, because if you were able to create a negative pressure, then this would have implications for um, possibly retracting a bulging uh, nucleus pulposus or, you know, or creating a fluid exchange in the, in the disc space. Um, the interesting thing about this study when it came out was that it, it didn't get a lot of headlines. And, and as sometimes happened, there was, a, there was a, I think of a, there was a Swedish uh, musculoskeletal um, uh, expert called Nakamson. And he, he basically decided that this, this wasn't of any real interest because it was only conducted on a small number of people. Um, and as, as such, it kind of went away. When a guru speaks, that's the, that's the final word. But a group of people thought, well, actually, this is quite interesting because if you can create a negative pressure, then that has various implications. However, it's not without shortcomings because the patient line for own, it was a question of um, 
Um, how do we target things? Now, when we're thinking about mechanical treatments, we then start to think, well, what about the man, you know, how manual um, therapists work? And, and as I say, we have physiotherapy, osteopathy, and chiropractic primarily, and each, each um, profession has its own particular way, whether that's Maitland mobilization, osteopathy has a variety of techniques, um, including harmonics, and chiropractic is well known with its uh, you know, flexion distraction. And this idea of you know, distracting and mobilizing joints is not new. So the question then becomes, well, how can we incorporate that for potentially for a category of patients who needs something more than manual therapy. So this question of specificity, um, specificity is my favorite word, I really like it, um, but um, uh, addressing the problem of specificity because many of the patients that you see who have an unresolved disc problem, often it's, 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 lo it's got a, uh, localized at a particular level, whether that's the L4 or the L5 disc or the C5, C6, um, it generally is at a particular area. And these earlier machines were non-specific. So the guy uh, that you can see there, hopefully, is uh, a, a U.S. neurosurgeon, Norman Sheely, who was actually uh, President Kennedy's um, physician. And a group of engineers and um, scientists uh, came up with a kind of an approach to think about how can we treat targeted spinal segments? And what they found was that by applying forces at precisely measured angles, they were able to open the intervertebral disc space um, by using a force up to, an, up to and over even half a patient's body weight. So that's quite a considerable amount of force, but this, that by changing the angle, they found that they were able to um, open different spinal segments. And they showed that um, they, they, they measured some of this. Um, and here in the uh, journal, uh, American uh, Journal of Pain Management, um, I just sort of a scan. Here we can see some of the some of these early experiments. This was bear in mind. This is back in 1997, and they looked at a study comparing decompression and uh, traditional traction. And whilst it's not very clear on the on here, we have a, a an opening of um, the space between the L4 and the L5 vertebra as an example. So how do we do, how do we, how do we, how do we decompress, how do we distract targeted spinal segments? Well, um, it comes back to, and I ask you to sort of go back to your school days and think of physics um, and, uh, and vector forces. Uh, I confess I didn't pay too much attention in my physics lessons at school, but um, I, I promise you it's fairly, um, fairly straightforward um, if I can understand this. So what we have here is we have um, the uh, y-axis and we have the x-axis and these red lines are force. Now, if we change the angle, as we steepen the angle at we, which we apply a force, the point of application of that force moves along the x-axis. So as we steepen the angle, we move further along. So that is physics. There's nothing, um, you know, uh, there's no witchcraft involved. That's just a, a straightforward scientific principle. When we come to translate that into an engineering solution to target spinal segments, here we have, um, um, I don't know if my, hopefully my mouse um, can be seen, um, but, but here we have practitioners, uh, this, is a, this is a motor, uh, raising, raising this um, up and being able to um, uh, focus force at specific levels. And how this translates um, into the spine is through a series of um, alternating angles, we can focus force um, and <coughs> open specific segments. Um, and typically by, we start say with the L5S1 at 10 degrees, and then we move up in sort of five degree increments. And those five degrees, a five degree change can make all the difference to how, uh, to the outcome to the treatment. When it comes to the cervical decompression, you will all use sort of manual um, traction uh, techniques. 
Um, and um, here we have, um, uh, you know, a, a typical sort of mechanical traction where um, gripping of the jaw, and the back of the skull um, with spinal, when we want to decompress uh, the levels, we can, we want to change the angle at which those force is applied. Now, obviously, the cervical vertebra are much smaller um, and, 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 it, and we're targeting sort of the, the, the area. But by changing the angle, we do direct the treatment to different levels of the cervical spine. So the question of how we achieve these high tensions. Um, so in a linear traction, so the, the, those traction machines that you saw, we had a straight line, uh, kind of almost like a winch, if you like. And this is a very unnatural force to the body and may actually prom prompt muscle spasm and cause an increase in intradiscal pressure. So therefore, uh, many, many times with uh, uh, traditional traction, you would use a, a, a lower force because it would be uncomfortable because you always had this risk of causing spasm. So the question you have to address is, so if we want to avoid spasm, what do we need to do differently? And here we have a sinusoidal waveform. Um, and on this, on this graph, we have, um, uh, this is time, and on the y-axis, we have the amount of force. And so we have a gradual curve that starts slowly, then increases, and then decelerates. This is a much more natural um, uh, waveform for the body. And we know that if we apply a slow stretch to the Golgi tendon organ, we cause it to fire and this inhibits tension. This allows the muscle to remain relaxed and lengthen because we want to um, uh, open the disc space, work soft tissues um, and to do that comfortably at a higher force. This high distraction force that we use is built up, is, is based around patient's body weight um, and is built up to uh, half body, well, around half body weight. We don't start at half body weight, we start under half body weight, um, but it can go up to and over half a patient's body weight. We're able to treat as many patients who are larger, even up to 190 kilos, which is considerable force. And something which I kind of say, a theme I want to get across is that this, this, this new category of treatment is not replacing manual therapy. It is a tool within a framework and the treatment tool cannot do uh, what you could do with your hands, but neither can we do with our hands what we can uh, achieve with a mechanical force, especially at these tensions. So what does an IDD spinal decompression treatment look like? So as I say, on the X, uh, sorry, on the Y axis, we have tension and it's in pounds. Um, and on the uh, X axis, we have time. So to begin with, in, a, in order, to, um, to, so, so in order to, to achieve the therapeutic objectives, we began with the measured angle of distraction, okay? We have the sinusoidal waveform, which allows us to apply these higher tensions comfortably. We have a high tension and a low tension and the high tension is held for one minute and we have a low tension in between. And what this means is that over the duration of the treatments, the tissues are under a constant tension. Okay. Um, the second aspect uh, of the sinusoidal waveform and coming back to our Maitland harmonics, our Cox flexion mobilization is this idea that when we want to mobilize then we can, we want to uh, distract the joint and then at the point of maximum distraction at that point, that is where the mobilization is most effective. And what here we have at the top of each high tension, we have an oscillatory component which mo adds an additional mobilization component. Now, back pain is obviously multifactorial and it's sometimes difficult to you know, be specific as to which part of the, uh, of the dysfunction is causing the pain. But all of these aspects of the distraction and the mobilization are occurring concurrently. Are we still good? <laughs> good. Um, so as we progress into this question of spinal decompression, we are uh, comfortably stretching and working soft tissues because we want to improve the range of motion in that joint which has become stiff and immobile. 
we want to distract and mobilize the uh, facet joints, which may um, become maybe impair in, impairing uh, mobility. We want to open the disc space to create pressure differentials for fluid exchange, as we know the, the discs don't have their own blood supply. And we want to, the creation of a negative pressure may, may promote the retraction of a bulging nucleus pulposus. And this is the key thing that I want to get across is that we're, we're not doing something to the body. We are helping the body. We're helping to remove restrictions so that we create an environment for the body to heal itself. When I first started with this, I thought that the negative pressure, the opening the joint would somehow suck everything back into the disc space. Now, whether that happens to a degree may be the case, may or may not be, but we're very much interested in that improved function and mobility because it is the body which heals itself. And I think that is why that is where this treatment tool is kind of engaging more and more with practitioners as they see it as a tool rather than a single modality. So this leads us to the IDD therapy and this, this kind of bringing everything together. We're talking about the decompression of intervertebral segments targeted to different spinal levels with dynamic distraction and longitudinal mobilization. And that's where we get the intervertebral differential dynamics. So we are targeting the level um, and then this Distraction and longitudinal mobilization is a key part of the therapeutic um, process with the treatment. Okay. And what you can see when patients are having the spinal decompression is that they are fully clothed and they are remaining comfortable. So I weigh, um, give or take, 90 kilos. Half my body weight would be about 45 kilos. Obviously, the treatment tensions are in pounds. But, but that is a considerable amount of force and something which is very difficult to apply with the hands in a longitudinal component comfortably. Most patients, when they're having the spinal decompression, go to sleep. They're completely relaxed. So as we think back to those questions about how we can improve treatments, we have what was called these IDD enhancements. So thinking of those early traction machines, some of the belts that were being used were pretty basic. They were a belt around the waist. So if we want to get a good solid grip and, and we want to focus our treatment, then by, by improving the harnesses, ergonomic harnesses, which grip the pelvis like a big pair of strong hands, give a, give a better uh, outcome. In the, in the spinal decompression, so as you've seen, in order to bring about the therapeutic effects, the patient is on the machine for 25 minutes. Many of the patients coming for this category of treatment, they're coming because they haven't responded to manual therapy and exercise, and often they're in a great deal of discomfort. So a vertical bed tilt allows the patient to get onto the treatment table comfortably. But more importantly, it is about when the patient finishes on the, um, uh, on, on the uh, finishes their treatment, the, the, the cycles of treatment have created a degree of instability. So it is really important when a patient returns to load bearing that we do that gently, gradually, and in a comfortable fashion. And so this is why we have this um, uh, functionality. It does make the machines a bit heavier, which makes my job harder when we're installing them, but we put the patient first. Then we have um, active, uh, active uh, tracking of each treatment so we know precisely what is happening. And in this age of evidence-based practice, this allows us to uh, be measurable and duplicable um, in uh, our, um, our treatments. And I think this, this question of evidence-based, um, and I'll, I will sh I'll share some uh, evidence with you, but in terms of your day-to-day -day practice, all of the clinics using IDD therapy will use a visual analog scale to record uh, the pain at each treatment, and also an Oswestrick disability index at different stages of a treatment program in order to um, observe and measure patients um, and how they respond um, uh, you know, how they are improving in their qu daily quality of life. Now, this functionality within the software, I liken to you're giving yourself, well, it's a little bit like um, building the gallows on which to hang yourself because you're building the capability to prove that your treatment doesn't work. 
Now, when we talk about this spinal decompression, we're not talking about a cure all which helps all, um, all patients, but a significant number of patients getting significant improvement is such that it warrants this level of attention. So in terms of an IDD spinal decompression program, what does that look like? So it's a course of up to 20 treatments. If I could hear you, I might hear, in, uh, hear an intake of breath because the standard treatment model um, within manual therapy tends to be at four to six treatments. Now, what I would say is that if, if the standard model of therapy was enough, there wouldn't be pain clinics. There would be no consultants. There wouldn't be um, pain management, injections, or surgery. There is a category of patient who needs something more, and we need to bring about change over time, gradually, because the body does it's a, or the body takes time to respond. Patients are coming three to five times a week. And the original protocol, it is a daily treatment for two weeks, then moving down to three treatments a week for two weeks, and then two treatments a week for six to eight weeks. Now, why is that? Why can't you come once a week? Well, because we need to make the body adapt to the treatment. Those treatment tensions start off um, on a, a lighter level, and then they are progressively increased to up to and over half a patient's body weight. When we think of the type of patients that are coming through for treatment, they are, in a, they, they are struggling. They have a lot of pain, a lot of dysfunction, and, and many haven't been able to exercise. So their condition tends to be fairly poor, and, and, and the change is not going to be sudden. It takes, it takes some time. And then a word about an MRI scan. So for those of you who have uh, are kind of familiar or heard some things about the treatment already, but for those of you who haven't, where a scan a scanning service is available, then we will always use an MRI scan or an X-ray. Now, this isn't diagnosis by um, uh, MRI and is not a case of um, that. You know, we all we all know that uh, uh, many discs are asymptomatic. We all might be sitting here um, with with a bulging disc, but patients tend to go for an MRI when the pain and the pain is such or the dysfunction is such that they are not um, improving. Um, now, the MRI will help the clinician to um, confirm their diagnosis, but importantly, it'll also rule out contraindications because we're very uh, much safety focused. OK, so a, we will use a scan when treating patients with a program of treatment. Obviously, in some countries, uh, a scan or in some areas, a scan is not available. And then a patient, a, a clinician will use their diagnostic assessment, hopefully to rule out the um, contraindications. Now, what does the treatment look like? Um, it is a 45 minute to one hour treatment. OK, um, and different clinics do things slightly differently, but typically we will look to use um, some some heat, <coughs> infrared heat for 10 to 15 minutes um, before patients begin. <coughs> that is to warm, um, warm the tissues and increase blood flow. OK, because we're going to be um, stre stretching them. Um, a patient is on the machine for 25, uh, 25 minutes and allowing sort of five minutes either side for harnessing, setting the patient up, We're talking roughly 35 minutes. And then we use um, when the patient finishes the treatment, then we will apply some cryotherapy for 10 minutes to kind of reduce any soreness because we are creating some micro trauma in the tissues from the cyclic distractions. Now, we are not just putting people onto a spinal decompression machine. All of the clinicians using the spinal decompression will incorporate manual therapy and exercise as an absolutely fundamental part of the program. The, 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 the spinal decompression is a, is a key part of improving the function of the lumbar spine, but we're also very interested um, in that cliche of looking at some of the causes of the problem. So whether that is issues in the hip flexors, hamstrings, stiffness in the thoracic spine, there are many things around the, uh, which, which need to be looked at um, um, for, with, with, with manual therapy. And of course, exercise. So whether, um, for example, McGill's exercise method, you may have your own specific exercise protocols. Um, I didn't mention, but I co-own a clinic in London, Spinex Disc Clinic, and we use a tool, Rehab My Patient, which um, allows us to prescribe, well, you know, the exercises that we want to prescribe to the patient, we give them to them. And this is, this is again, part of this holistic 
um, um, framework of rehabilitation. OK, so 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 this isn't just putting people onto a spinal decompression machine in order to get the most from it. It's co in combination with manual therapy and exercise tailored to the individual patient. Hopefully that resonates with you all. In terms of some other adjuncts that we use, um, so these, for example, this is um, uh, called uh, V-Move. Uh, these are gyroscopic sensors, and I'm very proud. Um, so my clinic um, it was the first osteopathic clinic in the country to incorporate these, um, but they're used widely around the world. And these sensors allow us to measure to the nearest degree flexion, extension, lateral flexion, and a whole host of other um, measures because we want to uh, we want to have supporting evidence in terms of we want to show that this isn't just a placebo, of course, um, but we want to be able to show to the patient their restrictions, but also demonstrate the improvements in range of motion as a result of our treatment. Um, and this is quite an exciting tool, and it lends itself very uh, very well to um, you know sort of evidence based practices and auditing your um, outcomes. Um, many clinics now um, provide um, liquid supplements. This is a sort of new category of supplementation which allows you to provide you know far higher doses of nutrients in a bioavailable way uh, this one uh, cartonica is something which uh, clinics sometimes give to patients alongside their treatment so let's so here we have the kind of a program but let's think about the indications and contraindications they're fairly um obvious i suppose um in terms of herniated bulging discs which is kind of what we're talking about here today uh, sciatica cervical radiculopathy degenerative disc disease facet syndrome um, patients actually with um, spinal stenosis can benefit from the treatment um, also in terms of uh, contraindications, again, they're fairly commonsensical, really. Um, Corder equina syndrome. Um, typically, a patient with uh, Corder equina is, is, is probably going straight to A&E or to see a consultant as an emergency. But we're not treating patients um, with, uh, with, with, a, you know, with any bowel or bladder dysfunction. Uh, spondylolisthesis, um, grade two or higher, um, we, we won't use. Um, we've got the spondy, uh, spondylolysis, any kind of fractures, osteoporosis, anything where we're, we, we're you know, at risk of uh, causing you know, um, uh, problems. Spinal surgery is interesting. So if somebody has had a fusion, um, then that is, um, you know, then, then, then with screws in the back, any kind of surgical hardware, we don't want to be applying these um, uh, forces. In terms of spinal surgery, um, then a microdiscectomy, obviously we would much rather a patient came for the spinal decompression before they had um, a microdiscectomy, but um, any sort of decompression surgery, um, uh, we would allow six months um, but after, after the surgery to allow time for healing. Patients under, eight, eight, under 18 years for, because of uh, their growth rates, pregnancy, uh, six months postpartum, uh, metastases, um, unfortunately, um, and then we have um, sort of spinal abnormalities, um, severe scoliosis. Um, pacemaker is in there. Um, as you might imagine, in America, it's a highly litigious society. Um, and and, whilst, and it hasn't, uh, the spinal decompression hasn't been shown to be safe with pacemaker, not that there have been any problems. Um, but we, we don't we don't put people on with a pacemaker. So in terms of evidence, there is a body of supporting evidence for the treatment. Uh, there is always a need for uh, more evidence. Um, and I'm just going to kind of show you a few uh, examples of, of, of why people get um, you know, are, are interested and excited. Uh, McClure and Farris looked at 415 patients um, and, and, and the sort of treatment success considered when there was a greater than 50 percent reduction in pain and improvement in function. Um, I think the standout here is that um, of 129 patients who, uh, McClure was a neurosurgeon, I'm sorry, for, um, in the Chicago area, um, 190, 129 patients considered surgical candidates, 92% um, of those had a success. And by that, I think we can say that they avoided having surgery. Now, of course, some people did still go on to having surgery, but in a cost benefit analysis of a non-surgical solution versus a surgical solution, I think, I think we would prefer the non-invasive um, route first. 
In terms of clinics, um, we're looking at, um, you know, we encourage clinics to audit. Now, if you're in private practice, it can be very, um, it can be onerous to try to um, uh, audit your own outcomes. But this, for example, Sports and Spinal Physio is a clinic in Brentwood in Essex. And uh, they um, uh, conducted a study, uh, sort of analysis of their patients um, and, and patients who have had injections. 86% um, of those who completed a course of treatment had a statistically significant improvement in their outcomes. Um, here's an MRI scan that was sent to me. Um, uh, the osteopath perhaps uh, knows Simeon Neil Asher, who's now based in e uh, Israel, known for frozen shoulder and trigger points. Um, he has a couple of um, spinal decompression machines. And actually, it, he was um, engaged by the treatment from seeing the outcomes with one of his cervical patients who went to America. Um, um, this was one of the earlier uh, pieces, um, which kind of, I suppose, got people interested. We're not rehydrating disc, but, but, but if a disc, uh, by creating an environment for the body to heal, if you want to improve hydration, then, then this is, a, this is a, allowing the body to um, move freely gives it that um, possibility. Um, in terms of another audit, um, I'm, I'm sort of looking at these audits, which are which are which are good. Um, Sussex Back Pain Clinic down in uh, East Sussex, Brighton, uh, Hove, in fact, um, looked at their patients. Um, and, I, and I think it's interesting and it's wor worth pointing out, actually, that of these uh, 144 patients in this um, you know, um, uh, cohort, um, there were some who had an increase in vast symptoms. OK, but it's a very but it's a very small percentage of the patients. And we and it's important, I think, to bear in mind that these patients are coming when other treatments have not worked most commonly. OK, um, but of these, we've got a 86 percent have an improvement in their Oslo Street and 90 percent have an improvement in their um, uh, VAS. And of these patients, um, the interesting at the bottom here, is cervical disc prolapse with ridiculous symptoms. And that's, uh, you know, always interesting. 100 percent of their, that in that group improved. That is not to say that every patient is going to improve, but in this particular group, it did. So this, this draws us to kind of what next for spine care. That gives, kind of gives you an overview of how the treatment works, how this spinal decompression works, and hopefully that it, it is a treatment tool within the uh, mix of, um, uh, you know, a treatment tool within a mix of how you, ca you know, care for your patients. Uh, this was actually sent to me last week. Um, this is a clinic with three uh, decompression machines. And I think in this kind of post pandemic era, I mean, even before the pandemic, I think there was this move away from uh, the invasive treatments. Um, spinal injections are, are also not are in terms of nice don't don't advocate um, injections and I think often they are given in isolation not within a framework of um, you know rehab um, but from a cost benefit perspective then um, then 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 this category of treatment has far greater uh, potential benefits than than, than than what we currently have um, there are over a thousand clinics globally providing treatments um, this is a little snapshot of the UK I remember when there was one pin on the board and now, as you can see, there is a, um, there are clinics kind of all over. There are plenty of gaps um, and we have a mix of practitioners, um, you know, physiotherapists, osteopaths, chiropractors, but they all share this, um, the, the common um, acceptance that there is a limitation to what they can achieve with their hands and they have seen um, and experienced the benefits of, of the treatment tool um, with their patients and with patients that come to them. And I think it's fair to say that if, they, if, if, uh, if, if you as a practitioner invested in something and found that it wasn't working, you'd be quick to take to social media or to return it to uh, the, the, the person who um, put you in contact with it. Um, and unfortunately, touch wood, that um, hasn't happened. Um, we have a mix of clinics um, and now we've got more insurance companies. So globally, there are um, uh, more insurance companies um, with, with the, um, uh, you know, paying for treatment here in the UK. Um, Aviva Insurance now pay for IDD therapy and they do so because of the outcomes 
they, they assessed the evidence, but they also looked at the outcomes of their patients who were potentially considered for um, uh, surgery. And I think of one example where a patient was due to have a cervical disc replacement surgery and underwent a course of IDD therapy um, and had, had a significant improvement, didn't need um, surgery. And, and, and now um, IDD therapy is, is kind of uh, on the list of approved treatments uh, with Aviva. As I say, we have a mix of oh, just kind of one thing actually on the um, insurance. As another example, uh, we're not just to say, we're not yet with Bupa or AXA, but interestingly, um, a patient in Edinburgh um, who had uh, approval for spinal surgery with Bupa, um, actually, uh, it's not when you don't choose to have spinal surgery, even if somebody else is paying for it, um, underwent a course of IDD therapy at the clinic, moved freely in Edinburgh and avoided surgery. So that probably saved uh, Bupa um, £10,000 at least um, in, uh, in, in payout. Uh, you're welcome. Um, so we hope and we expect that more insurance companies will cover this in the future. Um, we're not yet in um, uh, mainstream social medicine, but there will be more cost benefit. There's a big cost benefit for um, a conservative treatment plan um, for, for patients with unresolved back and neck issues. Um, this is um, so a typical uh, typical clinics. Um, this is, or, or Vanessa is not typical, she's wonderful, um, up in uh, North Yorkshire um, on, on osteopath providing treatment. Um, this is Michael in, in Liverpool, um, providing a mix of manual therapy and spinal decompression. Uh, we saw earlier um, a picture of multiple machines, less so here in the UK. We have one clinic with two machines and we have uh, one clinic who has two spinal decompression locations. Um, this is um, in actually in Malaysia. Um, this is uh, Larry from the US manufacturer North American Medical. And I think the thing to bear in mind, whenever you see a picture of the people using spinal decompression, they are all smiling. OK, um, I always smile and it's always a great pleasure when uh, I'm working with practitioners to see their their positivity. And and this last picture um, is actually um, in Oman um, pre pandemic end of 2019. And I kind of like this story because the gentleman on the right is um, Scott Johnston. He's a, an osteopath from um, Scotland and Scott um, would refer his patients uh, to the uh, spinal decompression clinic in Glasgow. Now, when Scott was looking to relocate to set up a new clinic, Muscat uh, Osteopathy in, uh, uh, in Muscat in Oman, he wanted the spinal decompression to be at the heart of his um, treatment. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and he has he's been um, uh, a great advocate of the treatment. So I think that this question, um, in terms of where we are now, the spinal decompression is helping to bridge, bridge that gap between the conservative treatment and invasive treatment. Uh, we're helping, um, one, one surgeon talks about patients being in back pain, no man's land, where manual therapy and exercise weren't enough, um, and they were perhaps going into that, going to a GP, uh, going onto a consultant, and, and the GP and the consultant are, are basically armed with sort of pain medication, injections or um, surgery. So if we can provide a, a, a framework of treatment, then um, we hope that that is a better outcome for the patient. And what I would say, one little story. So my late father, um, he, uh, he, had a, um, he had problems with his lumbar spine. He had IDD therapy. Um, he had some problems with his neck later on um, where he started to lose his balance and he had decompression surgery. So it is all about the right treatment for the right um, uh, patient. Okay, so I hope you're all <laughs> um, still awake. Um, and that would sort of conclude the presentation as I wanted to, um, to provide it.